Welcome everyone to our <laughs> Driftless Symposium. You're in the watershed track. We're going to uh, speak today on some of the stream assessments and water quality projects we've done in the city of Dubuque and around uh, the watersheds around Dubuque. So I'd like to keep this really informal. If you have any questions or you're into monitoring and you've done something different, just raise your hand or throw something and, and we'll talk about it. We've got plenty of time here. My name is Dean Mattoon. I work for the City of Dubuque Engineering Department. I've been an engineering technician with the city for about 13 years now. About 10 of those has been focused in water quality monitoring and MS4 stormwater management. We deal primarily in the MS4 world with inspection, maintenance, and compliance, as well as keeping our own database, tracking all the inspections that we do. Of course, we have a stormwater hotline, and that's how you can reach me. So this is our little area in the Driftless. Hard to see Dubuque in there. We're really focusing on a couple of different watersheds, both the Catfish Creek and the Bee Branch watershed, which both have kind of different functions. The Catfish Creek is a very mixed land use, everywhere from urban to ag to industrial to forest, uh, as well as a couple really cool uh, state park and Swiss Valley Nature Center. And really we're, we're working on ecological restoration within that. And the Bee Branch lies completely within the city of Dubuque limits, all urban, and they're really primarily focused on flood mitigation as well as water quality components. And we'll see a couple of that. And tomorrow we'll have another speaker from Dubuque to speak um, directly on the Bee Branch. So the Catfish Creek Watershed Management Authority Board was formed in 2012. We were really pushing for this well before these grant opportunities came along. We'd hired Eric as an urban conservationist so that we could bust out of corporate limits and start to work within watershed lines instead of corporate limits. Uh, our primary goal was obviously to, to create a watershed management plan and then go out for grant funding because we are not regulatory. We have no taxing authority in Iowa. So we're really relying on grant opportunities to get the projects in place and get the plans done. So we were fortunate enough in phase one and phase two to receive two different grants for the formation. The 2080 agreement is what it was that formed the Watershed Management Authority Board. And also for phase two, we had a $187,300 grant to prepare a watershed management plan with which Applied Ecological Services prepared for us. Phase three, we're just kind of working into as, as our plan is finalized and now we're looking for grant opportunities to go out for projects to kind of implement the plan. You can visit us on catfishcreekwatershed.org. We're on all the social media trappings you can think of, except Instagram, I think. So here's uh, just a, a brief look at the Catfish Creek watershed. You can see in the span of six or seven miles, we fall 600 feet. So it's quite a variance in topography. Everything flows down <clears throat> right to the Mississippi River in the main branch of Catfish. But there's five sub-watersheds there, if you can see that. The Bee Branch watershed, <clears throat> really, as I said before, was focused on flood mitigation. Um, the Bee Branch was a, a stream in Dubuque, and at one time, in the early 1900s, it was capped off and essentially made an underground sewer. Uh, and, and houses are built on top of it, and it just kind of flows down without people really knowing about it. Well, manholes were popping off the roads during flood events and it was causing a lot of hassle for people. So my boss about 12 years ago started looking at ways to, to mitigate those flooding issues. And they've done a number of projects preliminarily before the Bee Branch Daylighting Project, which is really the showcase. Uh, we built a, a Carter Road dam, which kind of holds back uh, an enormous amount of water from the very headwaters of Bee Branch. And then we retrofitted our 32nd Street Detention Basin to include some stilling pools uh, to reduce sediment and nutrients before it heads on down into the underground section. Phase one of the construction of, of the creek restoration and daylighting itself was completed a couple of years ago. It includes some walking trails and fishing and boating access in, in the detention basin at the end of it. Phase two is about ready to get underway and it's another four or five blocks of daylighting which there'll be a linear park and, and all sorts of interpretive signs and, and it's near a school so the kids can get out and kind of play in the creek. There'll be limestone blocks you can walk down in and kind of play around and we're hoping to see this daylighting really affect the ecology of the stream and get some of those benthics back in. 
And then we've got the, the Bee Branch Watershed Green Alley program as well, which is, uh, is a lofty goal, but we're well on our way to every single alley in Dubuque, which is in the Bee Branch, to be permeable pavers. And they chose the pavers as opposed to concrete or asphalt. It looks kind of like Old Town Dubuque. A lot of the streets were paved in pavers long ago. So, so there's a, just a quick look at the Bee Branch watershed, all urban. This is kind of hard to see, but this is every alley in the B branch. The green ones are completed and the orange ones are scheduled for next year through a, through a SRF sponsorship project. The SRF sponsorship project started in Iowa and, and anybody familiar with that? Anybody from Iowa here? All right, you guys familiar with SRF at all? State revolving fund loans, recently they they created a program called a sponsorship program where if you're going to do a capital improvement on a water utility, such as our first one was our wastewater treatment plant, was a $65 million project, rather than paying back the state interest on that, they let us take the interest dollars and focus it towards a water quality improvement project, which is a, just a fantastic idea. So that's where the green alleys came from. And I'll talk about our next SRF uh, project that we're doing through the B branch daylighting here in just a little bit. So before we get into the actual water quality monitoring, I, I just want to speak briefly on how we do our inspections. I'm sure we've all been through this. Anybody in the inspection field, regardless of what it was, has started out on paper and uh, not even a digital camera. Um, we quickly moved into trying some third-party softwares for MS4 compliance, and I found that those really weren't customizable enough for my taste. So I created an access database and kind of linked it to the GIS, and we were using some Trimble GPS units. And eventually, we started getting the iPads, and they, and they have GIS-based apps right on them. Uh, you can use the Verizon signal for triangulation, so you actually get a better quality of, um, of GPSing built-in camera, so everything now is on our maps. Videos, photos are linked right to the points on our GPS points on our inspection forms. So we never have to take back stuff to the office and put folders in one, you know, photos in one folder and then GIS in another place and everything's kind of linked together. So it makes it real nice. So our monitoring. Um, now this is really our baseline monitoring. We perform these between 2010 and 2012 and it was really just kind of our first attempt at getting out there and starting to get some data. We knew we needed a lot of data to figure out where we were at in the world and what was going wrong. So we had a number of programs started. Uh, first one was our monthly monitoring. This is this was a very lofty goal, 27 locations every month. When you think about we have to do construction site, post-construction site inspections, uh, elicit discharge, public education, and then we're out trying to, to get this done as well. But we did fairly well. We typically did three to five locations per watershed. And this is five forks of the catfish and then the bee branch. And then we did some summer monitoring, which is obviously our, our benthic IBI and our habitat assessment, and then our illicit, illicit discharge detection and elimination monitoring. And then we had a couple of project-specific monitoring uh, projects we'll talk about. And then last but not least, our favorite, the rapid stream assessment. So our monthly monitoring, anybody from Iowa or even over in Wisconsin familiar with Iowa Water, the Iowa Water program? All right. It's a great program put on by the Iowa DNR, and once you become certified and you pick your little section of the stream that you want to test in, as long as you're putting your results into their database, they keep sending you testing equipment for free. So this is something that, that we've promoted ever since we were an MS4 community. In fact, if you live around the Dubuque area or in Catfish Creek Watershed and you want to do this, we'll pay for your, for your training because it's useful to us too. We have many monitors around Catfish. So these are the typical ones that they, they test for, and then we've added some additional tests down the road. So as I go through these, I'll just kind of give an example of, of what we found. This was from three years of monitoring, and this would just happen to be in the B Branch watershed. Our findings were pretty normal, a pH range of six to nine. Ammonia spiked a little bit there. Nitrogen was, was low, phosphate was fairly low. 
everything looked pretty good uh, as far as trends goes. The pH tended to dip to, to six in late fall. Uh, we had two spikes of, of nitrate. I, these are dip strips through Iowa water. I suspect that they were just bad strips and that happens sometimes. You keep retesting and you'll get a, a lower number. So, Some of the outliers we found though was a phosphate spike of eight, which is typically uh, indicative of wastewater. So we thought we may have a problem there. Uh, transparency and conductivity were low on two occasions uh, where the dissolved oxygen was also low. And this is one of those situations where we instantly took our data and looked back on our map, found that we had an active construction site upstream, went and inspected that and their detention basin had filled with sediment and it was leaking down. So we were able to stop that problem right away. Chloride uh, spiked in April. Obviously, that was a snow runoff issue. We're a very hilly landscape, and they use a lot of, lot of salt for, uh, just for protective reasons for, for the citizens. So in the summertime, uh, we do our benthic IBI. Anybody do benthic invertebrate testing here? Okay. Three of us, all right. So... <laughs> These are always done in the summertime months. You never want to do the same location more than three times in the summer or you risk uh, harming that, that microhabitat. But what you do in, a, in an IBI, which is an index of biotic integrity, is you're counting not only the different kinds of bugs you find, but the number of them. And then that, that goes to a rating system and it kind of gives you a quick overall idea of the health of the stream. So really they're classified into three categories, a low pollutant tolerant, which is your high quality bugs, a medium, and then a high pollutant tolerant species, which is the bad bugs, bloodworms and uh, rat tail maggots and things that you don't want to find in your stream. So let's see here are some of the trends. We did seven tests in those three years. We found high quality species in three of the seven tests at this particular location, not the greatest. Uh, and this was the same location where we found the spike of, of phosphate. So we did some more analysis. We started running some E. coli tests, some optical brightener tests, found that they were both present, optical brightener and E. coli, which meant we had a wastewater problem. So we started inspecting our lines. We have a TV crew that comes in and, and can TV all of our storm and sanitary lines. Found that we had a break, so we quickly lined that to, to uh, solve the problem. Although we're still seeing remnants of it down at the 32nd Street Detention Basin, we're getting a high presence of duckweed, which kind of naturally forms to try and eat that stuff away. Uh, this little guy is a crane fly. Those of you who never found one, they're pretty ugly. It looks like he's got a couple eyes and some I don't know, tentacles, kind of like Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. That's actually its butt. Its face is over here. So I don't know. That's weird. The uh, habitat study in the summertime was really kind of replaced quickly by our rapid assessment program. Really, you're just going out to the areas that you test, taking a picture, looking at the riparian land use, any evidence of human presence, whatever microhabitats happen to be in the stream. So it's just a quick survey of that particular area. Uh, done once a year. Photos are attached to our points. The IDDE monitoring in the summertime, this is uh, part of our MS4 permit and really what you're doing is going out to all of the different outfalls that fall really close to the stream during a low flow rain event, which means you, you can't inspect these pipes any less than 72 hours after a recent rainfall. And really what we're looking for is pipes that are flowing and why. And this is really tough in Dubuque because we have groundwater seepage into our storm lines and we have a lot of springs. So we developed this little system for a quick analysis because I can't carry all this chemistry stuff out into the field with me, fluoride and, and all these different things. So I went around and I found an old spring house next to the creek and I tested that. And I, I tested the influent wastewater coming into our plant and I tested one of our local car washes, their, their kind of pit, and then some tap water. And I tested them for some basic criteria so if I do see something flowing, I can just do a quick analysis to see if it matches up with anything. But more often than not, your eyes and your nose are the best indicators for these. If you smell something funky or it doesn't look right, chances are it's an illicit discharge and you have to try to work your way up the pipe and figure out what it is. So it's kind of fun, it's like a treasure hunt, only you don't really like the treasure. <laughs> uh, 
Here's one of our sample IDE, IDDE sites. This happened to be on the city island, which used to be a garbage dump. And they just kind of built it up and then commercialized it. Uh, we found this little outfall flowing really rusty and it had a really ammonia smell to it. So we started doing some testing, working our way up the line and it led right to the dog track. And what was happening were the dogs were kind of peeing in their kennels and they were kicking the sand out of there right into their street corridors and it was going right down into a corrugated metal pipe which which left here so after 25 years all of that sand kind of built up in the corrugated pieces of the pipe and then started flowing so we had the lines inspected and flushed and then test for a while to make sure we were we were doing good and then worked with the dog track to try and put up some fencing barriers to to keep that from happening some of our project specific monitoring any questions so far I'm going awful fast here. I got to slow down. Take a drink of tea. Well, they can still do it in their kennels, but the problem was um, it was just a chain link fence, and they're just kicking it right out of their area, right out into the street. So when it rained, it would it would collect into the storm drains. So I think they put up some black screens around the perimeter of that chain link. So if they were kicking, it'd kick and fall back in their pens. Yep, yep, yep. It's a fun job. <laughs> what was that uh, nitrate level for Dubuque? It was 0.2 or 0.02? Zero to 0.2. Zero to 0.2. Yeah. And that was just at that particular location. We do have spots both in town and in the watershed and, and ag communities where it is a lot higher at specific times. You know, we reached areas over 10. So it, it varies widely. From Where what does the drinking water in Dubuque come from? From deep, deep water aquifers, about 600, 800 feet deep at least. Yeah, the funny thing about that is they put phosphate in the water actually to keep, we have a lot of old lead pipes for water lines in Dubuque and that kind of keeps those from bursting. The, the little bit of phosphorus kind of coats the lining. So they put phosphorus in and the wastewater treatment plant is now charged with taking phosphorus out. So we're thinking we'll take it out and then sell it back to the water department maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so this was a project specific uh, study that, that Eric and I did just to kind of get a snapshot of Catfish Creek. And we wanted to see, we knew we had some problems with E. coli. So we decided to do um, a co-op, which is quality assurance project plan. It's certified through the state. They know it's legit. We're following all the protocol sending uh, all of our tests to the Iowa State Hygienics Lab for analysis. We took samples every two weeks for six months, right Eric, at 15 different locations. We tested for E. coli, total phosphorus, and total nitrogen. The results were quite staggering, especially after a rainfall event. Our state standard is 235 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. Uh, we were hitting 24,000. And I suspect that any stream in this nation at this point probably has this problem. So uh, yeah, we, we definitely, as a result of that, all five forks of the catfish were placed on the 303D list, which sounds bad, but if they're not on the 303D list, you can't get funding to help them. So I know I struggled with that for a long time, putting them on there. And we did a chloride study a few years ago this was kind of our baseline data. We did it in the summertime to get our background levels and they were obviously well under state limits for acute and chronic levels. But we test for chloride hardness, sulfate, to be able to get an accurate uh, representation of, of what kind of chlorides are in, in the stream. So I think it was one week for yeah, a couple of months. These are the areas uh, that we tested. Up there is Bee Branch Creek, and this is the North Fork of Catfish, and this is the Middle Fork of Catfish. Uh, not to scale. But uh, Site 1 we chose because it was fairly close to the headwaters, and we didn't think that we'd have any kind of chloride inundation from, from uh, snow plowing. What is the chloride standard? Chloride? Do you know off the top of your head? It's a diff we don't. For acute and chronic levels? Well, yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what the statewide... Well, we had these taken into analysis from the DNR, so 
that we're just relying on their results to tell us that we were well under. I don't, I don't have the calculation, but I've got the numbers somewhere if you're interested what, what those standards are and can get them to you. So the B branch was the headwaters. Um, site two was in the North Fork, and we took this straight from an outfall pipe. It was, the outfall pipe was draining a fairly heavily residential area, so I figured we'd get some chloride inundation from, from uh, salt road salting. And then site three was in a heavily commercialized area right underneath a bridge where the bridge outfall just drops right down into the stream. I think you can probably guess what our triggered events created in the winter time. We did five tests in four months and uh, also some triggered events. Anytime there was a rainfall event in the winter or we had a heavy snow melt, we'd try to get out there and take a sample. Ours happened to be one of the highest chloride levels in the test group and, and I think I attribute that to our topography and the fact that they, they you have to use so many road salts for safety reasons. Um, this was partnered through the Wisconsin DNR and originally they did this test and they found that chloride matches perfectly with conductivity as your chloride rises your conductivity rises and they found that quite alarming so uh, they received a grant to do additional state uh, monitoring which is how we got into it. So we got to figure out a way to, to stop that. This is our favorite water quality monitoring program which is the rapid stream assessment or RASCAL which is a rapid assessment of stream corridor along length was developed by the IDNR and really what you're doing is stopping every for the assessment you're stopping every 500 foot and asking yourself a series of questions about the past stream taking a picture you're also stopping every time you have bank erosion or any time you discover a point of interest these are the kind of things that we're looking for every 500 feet so you're counting on one hand the number of pools you've hit which are waist high uh, other hand, you're counting the number of riffles you've seen. Uh, you're trying to kick through sediment and bedrock to determine what it is and look for any kind of aquatic habitat. Trying to remember what the canopy cover was, what percentage, and all of these different factors, which even for two people is quite tough, and you don't really get to enjoy it as much as you'd like to because you're in chest waders, just walking streams for a living. It's beautiful. So this is a sample of, of what we found the first time we went down the North Fork. So this is, each one of these blue triangles is pretty close to 500 feet. And there's kind of the criteria that we have. You can see it's a long list of questions that you have to remember in that section. There's the point of interest. So while you're trying to keep track of that, you're stopping every time you see a broken pipe or any kind of outfall or a sanitary crossing or a dead critter or a trash pile or a, a you know, fallen tree or a debris jam. So that was 92 of those in that three and a half mile stretch. And then anytime we found significant bank erosion, we'd stop and just try to capture the average height and, and length of it and how deep we thought it was eroding away per year. And the state had a, a quick formula to determine the erosion in tons per year. So we originally took that data, which a lot of it we didn't use, because it was just really raw data. It was good to have, I guess. But this particular map, <clears throat> all the blue triangles are, are outfalls that are coming into that stream section. And the, the colored line there is your bank height. So as we walked this, the water height was the same all the way through. But as you got down towards the end, the bank heights got like this and eroded away and you could just, it almost painted a picture for you what would happen after a two or three inch rain event. And that creek would rise and, and just wash everything out. So that was kind of eye opening to be able to correlate that with kind of the things that we see after a rain, rainfall event. Primarily, I think our, the, our biggest use of this first round of RASCAL data was just capturing trash locations. Then we held a huge stream cleanup and we took, I think, two tons of trash out of both the B branch and the North Fork. So it was very valuable for that. So that was kind of our baseline monitoring data. And, and now that we've done that and we've kind of got some results, we kind of know where we're at, we started to change things up a little bit. We've reduced our frequency and location down to one, one testing point per watershed. 
in addition to one more along the catfish line, which is a cold water trout stream. So in that section, we do an, uh, an additional monitoring site. We're doing them quarterly now. And the reason for this is if you have and can do them monthly, I think it's a lot better. But for us now, a quarterly is a good baseline for the end of our watershed or sub watersheds. Now what we're really trying to do <clears throat> is look at project specific testing. So now that we have our watershed management plan in place and we go to do a project, we'll want to monitor above and below before and after and, and try to see the changes in that, see how they correlate to our, our modeling for pollutant reduction. Primarily dry weather monitoring That's when uh, a large amount of monitoring really helps. And we're looking at putting in two to three real time monitors within Catfish now so you can really kind of see that a lot better than just going out and getting a snapshot when it's raining or yeah. But yeah, I would say on the quarterlies now, I would probably, if I have a choice, go dry weather so that I can kind of get an ac accurate scope. So we're doing, instead of the Iowa water program now, our wastewater treatment plant's got a certified lab. So I'm trained to do E. coli, total suspended solids, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. So we'll just be using that from now on. I think it looks better on grant applications when you have state certified testing results even though we still rely heavily on, on the Iowa water folks and, and all the, the great monitoring people that are out there. This is kind of our new rascal now. Uh, I was kind of talking about how the rascal data got a bit cumbersome when you're out in the field. And this has changed a lot now, now that we have our iPads because we can triangulate even in the summertime. Before when we were rascaling, it was only October 30th to maybe until it snowed a lot. And that was because of all the foliage on the trees. You couldn't triangulate and get a good signal. Now we can get a signal anytime. So before we were pumping out maybe four or five miles a year, maybe 10 miles a year if we were lucky before it just got too cold to be in the stream. So it took us a long time to get the 50 some miles of, of stream data that we have. And now we can go back and recheck those at any time, see it in different, uh, different uh, seasonal conditions. and Now really what we're looking at, and we've stolen this kind of model from Applied Ecological who did our watershed management plan, but now we're, we're asking ourselves some very broad questions. What's our degree of channel, sin channel sinuosity? What's our degree of channelization? Is there a lot of erosion in there? Do we have good pool riffle development? And then at the bottom, we ask ourselves a series of questions. What could we do to better this section? Could we tuck back those banks and uh, do we need natives or do we have to go hard armoring on these sections? So while we're out in the field, we can actually look at some of these things and, and develop a plan while we're there looking at it, as well as taking numerous pictures and videos and attaching them right to our line work uh, from GIS in the field. That's, um, it's gonna be a, a, a lot better system in the end, I think. So the South Fork is kind of our first project now that uh, we received an SRF sponsorship project. The B Branch is, is going out for bid for their phase two construction. And because they're a stormwater utility, we were applicable for a, another sponsorship project. So we got 1.4 million in the interest that would have been paid back from, from B Branch to come towards Catfish Creek. So it was a good win for us. Um, the South Fork was probably the number one spot, this area of the South Fork, that when Eric and I would go out to speak, someone would raise their hand and say, have you seen the South Fork at this area? Because it looks really bad. So we went and walked it, and, and yeah, there's a lot of crud on the substrate, and it doesn't seem like it takes only an inch of rain to get really turbid. And we're smack dab in the middle between a new industrial center and the landfill. And I know the landfill, they may have had some problems in the past, but they're doing a lot of monitoring now, and I don't feel that's, that's the issue. But we're not quite sure what it is. So the, we felt like this was a good, a good first starting point. So the goal for this area, and it happens to be city owned too, so it's really nice. We can just go on and do the project. We don't have to, to work with a landowner, although we have many projects in our plan where we would like to work with landowners. 
So basically restoring this riparian area, uh, in some cases removing up to 10 feet of soil deposits that have happened over the years, which have caused that high degree of channelization and the water can't get out into the floodplain, so it just erodes the banks away. So we want to get that to where it can spread out. We'll do a, a massive amount of native planting through that 15 acres. Some stream bank restoration, we'll tuck those back, bench them off so they can get up and out of there. I was just listening to someone in the beginning talk about numbers um, for projects and wanting to know that. So I just looked at our watershed management plan. This is based on the Steppel model for pollutant reduction. But a typical scenario like this, about a mile of stream, uh, to do the stream bank restoration and the riparian zone um, restoration, we're talking about 2,186 tons of suspended solids per year that that would reduce. 1,858 pounds of total phosphorus per year. 3,716 pounds of total nitrogen per year. Just in a mile of stream bank restoration. So you can see, you know, as we start to partner and we start to put these projects in the ground, we can make a big difference really fast. And it also helped that the landfill is getting ready to cap a section, um, one of their cells, and they needed some topsoil. And, and we're going to have a lot of topsoil on this project, so we'll be able to partner with them. This is kind of a picture of it. It's hard to see on this screen, but you can see the banks right there, about 10 to 12 feet deep, and it's just taking them out every time it rains. So other projects and future goals, um, the city of Dubuque has always had a rain garden program and a stream bank stabilization program where uh, we'll pay for the material cost up to half for your project. We've got some more projects possibly with this SRF money. Uh, we'd like to do permeable pavements in Swiss Valley Nature Center and Mines of Spain. Uh, we'd like to do some soil quality restoration wherever we can and partner with, with residents, landowners as well as doing uh, many of our detention basins, retrofitting them for infiltration, start capturing and treating that water. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. He's my partner in crime, our urban conservationist. We'll let him finish this out talking about watershed management. <laughs>